Though Airbus had seen off the challenge of the 311, there was mounting concern that it would not have enough customers to become viable. Airbus industry was convinced that the American market would embrace the new airliner because of its similarity to the popular DC-10. Despite reports of a slowing aviation market and stagnation in the American economy, aviation traffic increased 11% between 1969 and 1970. Short to medium range airliners captured 54% of seat miles, so Airbus was optimistic the A300B would find its niche. The London to Paris route was a key example. In 1958, there was just one route carrying 500 airline passengers a day between the two cities. By 1968, the number of routes had risen to 16 and was estimated to rise to 56 in the following decade. Airbus estimated it would sell 400 A300B airliners to service this and similar European routes. The A300B is a wide-body aeroplane powered by two large fan jets and designed for short and medium-range routes. Design work and market studies started several years ago. And so the A300B was firmly launched. With the wings coming from one place, the engines from another, moving the A300B components around the world was a major logistical challenge. Enter the Super Guppy an enormous wide-bodied cargo plane manufactured by U.S. company Aerospace Lines. The first Super Guppy was created from the fuselage of a C-97J turbo stratocruiser, the military version of the Boeing 377. With an inside diameter of 25 meters, the Super Guppy was the ideal vehicle to ferry outsize airplane parts. Airbus used four Super Guppies to transport A300B components from their various factories to Toulouse for final assembly. The joke went, every Airbus is delivered on the wings of a Boeing. The Super Guppy had tremendous lifting capacity, but only needed a relatively short runway. Its sharp turning capacity belied its ponderous size. The US Space Agency used Super Guppies to transport rocket sections between California, Alabama, and Cape Kennedy. Without a cargo aircraft this big, the agency would have had to ship components along the Panama Canal, a journey of several weeks. Super Guppies could cruise at 265 miles an hour, carrying a 40,000 pound payload. Unlike earlier transport giants, the Super Guppies fuselage was custom made and featured a bigger cargo compartment, a fully hinged fuselage for easy access and a pressurized cabin. Airbus Industries' own Super Guppy. Its destination, Toulouse, carrying large sub-assemblies, a rear fuselage or a center section, a forward fuselage or the wings, all the parts that go to make up the world's only wide-body twin jet, the A300B. It was certainly a mammoth undertaking. When the components arrived in France, they were transported along country roads, presenting an amazing spectacle. Although the Airbus featured the first composite materials used on aircraft, making it much lighter than its competitors, its pieces were a major logistical challenge to move. French townsfolk gaped as the trucks made their way cautiously along the narrow roads. Finally, they arrived at the Toulouse assembly hall, where the center wing box section was pushed into position. The following morning, the rear fuselage section was moved alongside the assembly line ready to be connected to its sister parts. Toulouse was the focal point for the Airbus program when the orders finally came in, delivering hundreds of A300B aircraft in the first few years of manufacture. And it remains the Airbus manufacturing hub today. At Toulouse, a number of flight deck mock-ups have been built, including a flight simulator built alongside the Concorde simulator and sharing the same computer. Says Max Fischel, one of Airbus Industries' test pilots and his crew who have been closely involved in the design of the spacious flight deck. Airline pilots were also consulted. Finally, it was time for the most anticipated moment of the A300B schedule, its official unveiling.
It was the world's first glimpse of a completed A300B, and the aeroplane taxied around the tarmac without incident before being parked next to another European technological marvel in the form of the Concorde. On the 28th of October 1972, a month ahead of schedule, it finally took to the skies, spending an hour in the air over France on its maiden flight. At the controls were aerospatial veteran Max Fischl as captain and head of flight testing, Bernard Ziegler second in command. Although protocol usually dictated that the boss was captain on the maiden flight, Bernard, son of aerospatial CEO Henri Ziegler, said he wanted to reverse that to make it a team effort. I was not willing to have any longer a star in the system, he said. The decision was to the surprise of the Airbus management of that time, Bete and my father. <laughs> 